So good evening, everybody. Welcome to our dugout uh, workshop. It's uh, the first of two work or uh, two webinars, I should say, uh, that we're doing in this series. I'm really happy that Sean has agreed to come and present. Um, he's very knowledgeable, and I always appreciate his expertise on all things water. Um, so um, I'm just going to turn it over to Sean. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, you can hear me well, sound check. Okay, yeah, so thanks for um, organizing this and hosting this. It uh, came together fairly well. Um, and so tonight in this first part, I'll, it's uh, the design, construction, and operating systems part. So that's what I'll be talking about. And I'm, I'm an agricultural water engineer, by the way, based out of Barhead. Traditionally, for many years, I've uh, provided counseling for clients on water management uh, planning, water treatment, and uh, water quality assessment as well. And currently, I'm able to ask answer questions um, regarding that nature. And so here's the order in which I'll be talking about these um, aspects in the part one. And in the second part, I'll be talking about other um, aspects such as water treatment and fish dugouts. So just to start off, uh, it, it, I have to chuckle every so often I'm um, talking with uh, agricultural producer and they happen to mention, well, um, you know, it, it can't be that hard to dig a dugout. It's just a hole in the ground. And because this is sort of, you know, a tagline I use that a dugout is not just a hole in the ground. In fact, it can be quite uh, a lot that goes into the design and maintenance and, and operation of the dugout. Water quality is more challenging than for a well say like groundwater because of the variability a flock of geese can come and swoop in and leave some parting gifts or wildlife uh, runoff events can carry sediments and erosion in into the dugout which can cause water quality problems so it's easily influenced um, from outside sources and so even monitoring has to be more frequent as well contractors vary in experience um, so it is important to get a good contractor. So the, um, there are the various uses uh, for dugouts require specific design and operation as well. The number one um, use has generally been livestock usage. There's also pesticide spray mixing. So the clean water to mix with the pesticides for spraying, aquaculture, irrigation, aesthetic and recreational. And here's the one I hope won't be uh, needed more in the future, but we should be planning for it, firefighting. Back some years ago, some local fires may have been more prevalent and it's sure nice to have some water nearby in case there is a fire, you know, especially in the rural area. And in some areas of the province, uh, dugouts can be used for domestic usage. Um, you know, uh, hopefully not for drinking water, but for other household usage. And I would like to run a poll at this time just to see what dugouts uh, you're interested in, you know, what types of uses you're interested in. So if Kelly, you could launch the poll. Here's the, thank you, Kelly. So you're allowed to select multiple uses here. So click on any and all that apply to you. And I don't see the numbers. So maybe Kelly could let me know how the poll is going. So I'll just give you some time to answer those questions. Yeah, just as we, we were waiting, when I grew up on the farm, I remember when we had to put a fire out, if we were burning grass, we used to do that. Things could get dicey. Okay, so here are the all results. As results as usual, the number one usage is livestock watering. Um, irrigation is a, a good second at one third. And there's also um, stocking with fish, recreation. And, and by the way, again, stocking with fish will be in the part two. But again, a lot of the aspects that are needed for stocking fish are found in this part one as well. 
recreation, um, no household, uh, water for spring crops, and a good. So there are quite a number of uh, people interested in fire control as well, probably because of the latest news we've heard and the news we've heard for a while now. Thank you for answering that poll. So uh, the next part is everyone's favorite topic, the regulatory issues regarding dugouts. Alberta Environment and Parks, or AEP is the acronym, which I'll use, is the regulatory body for most um, regulatory issues. And you can consider that there are two main aspects of regulatory issues. One is an approval to construct the physical works of the dugout. And another is a license to use the water. It may, you may not require license, but in some cases you may. So there are exemptions where you do not need to apply for a license to use the water. It is illegal to sell the water. Some people do sell access to the water for, for some uses. Uh, and for example, the government realizes um, that it's better to use surface water sources um, rather than you know, uh, quality groundwater for some uh, operations. So um, an AEP approval for dugout is not required unless the construction volume is greater than 2,500 cubic meters. That's about 550,000 imperial gallons or Canadian gallons, essentially the same. An example of that size is 167 feet by 60 feet on the top by 13 feet deep with end slopes of three to one and side slopes of 1.5 to one. 1.5 you know, is fairly steep. For example, it's the steepest we allow under our funding program for dugouts. And also it's not required unless it's located in a water course with fish in a lake or a wetland subject to the Water Act, or if located in the same water course and parcel of land as an existing dugout. Now, if your first dugout is not much of a dugout at all, that may not be an issue, but it's a lot of people aren't aware of this second dugout uh, rule for approval. <clears throat> this is a question, what is a wetland? This is a question that has been asked a lot and debated and talked about a lot over the years. And so I thought, and I, I get a lot of questions about it over the phone. So I thought I'd include a, a good definition from the Alberta wetland cause policy. It defines a wetland as land saturated with water long enough to promote wetland or aquatic processes as indicated by the poorly drained soils, hydrophytic vegetation, and various kinds of biological activity that are adapted to a wet environment. So that's a pretty good definition. Now you don't have to phone me about that. Uh, approval based on usage is also required for, for these uses is, as such as aquaculture, commercial uses, municipal uses, tank loading facilities. So for example, where farmers drive to fill up their uh, water trucks for spraying herbicides and irrigation. Uh, for the licensing aspects of the regulatory requirements, um, it's required for dugouts with a capacity or a constructed volume greater than 12,500 cubic meters, which is about 2.75 million imperial gallons. Example of this is 300 feet long by 127 feet wide on the top by 18 feet deep with two to one slopes all the way around. Also, if you use half of that amount of water annually, a license will also be required. So that's about 6,250 cubic meters or 1.375 million imperial gallons. Also the minister or director has discretional power under section 35 of the Water Act. As far as siting goes, you want to site your dugout in low areas um, so you can capture the runoff, but you don't want to be in valuable wetlands, um, you know, making the wetland disappear because we will need wetlands. And I think that point is driving home more and more as we see the fires across the Western US and BC and Saskatchewan. A lot of the smoke we're getting here in my area has been from Saskatchewan. And I've gotten calls from Saskatchewan, which I'll talk about probably in, and Albert as well. Uh, I'll talk about in the second part, 
regarding cattle deaths. Um, so yeah, try to avoid those valuable wetlands. Uh, also near a waterway, it's important. So you can capture you know, that water from the waterway and it should fill eight out of 10 years in order to be uh, you know, reasonable or, or to have a good value because uh, as I've often said, water is most valued when it's gone. And so in the time of drought is when you need the water the most. So it's sort of a rule of thumb if it should fill eight out of every 10 years. You also want it in an open area where there's natural aeration and so that debris doesn't fall into the dugout. And the, there's the picture is an example of that. The trees are you know, further removed in the distance. Sketches, and I just draw your attention to the top right sketch. Here the dugout is constructed in a water course. That is not recommended because once the water hits the dugout, the water slows down and the sediments being carried in the water drop out uh, and they fill up the dugout. And I'll show a picture about that later. They also, the sediments carry nutrients uh, that present poor quality of water. In the bottom right sketch, the dugout is in the water table. So the water can come um, into the dugout from the water table or go out of the dugout into the water table. And it can be, uh, it can be, it may not be dependable you know, if there's a drought and whatnot. Uh, and it can also contaminate the aquifer. Um, in the top, well, I should say in, in the bottom left sketch here, here you see a sketch of where the water is running in a waterway beside the dugout and you can allow the water to enter the, into the dugout. And it's the, the water is filtered um, by that grass waterway and it's also filtered by, by the buffer strip that surrounds the dugout um, that, you know, that so the water can enter it in all around the dugout. It's generally preferable to have the water enter in, in at one controlled point to prevent problems. Again, with siting, um, you want to avoid locating dugouts close to manure storage areas. A lot of this is quite common sense, but you may not think about it. Animal confinement areas, disposal sites, pesticide fertilizer and fuel storage areas septic fields and septic tanks, saline seeps. And as far as the trees go, they can you know, provide leaves, twigs, roots, uh, falling into the dugout and, and destabilizing the slopes. Um, so you wanna keep the deciduous, deciduous uh, trees 50 meters away and the coniferous 20 meters away. That way you won't get the leaves falling in or maybe some acidity coming from the coniferous trees. And also it allows some wind, natural wind aeration on the dugout as well. Here's some examples of poor siting. Uh, in the bottom left picture, you can see the trees are very close to the dugout. So you, you can see trees falling in the dugout, there's branches and there has, have been leaves falling in. And you can see that water is a dark color. A lot of that is dissolved organic uh, content coming from those trees. Um, so that's what the bullet says, organic matter intrusion. As well, there's poor aeration because of the little wind action. And in the bottom right picture, that you can see there's a yard in the back. Well, you may not see, but there's buildings in the background. There's a yard there and there are nutrients coming from the yard in this example. And you can see the algae growing on the surface of the dugout. As well, it is an odd shape um, of the dugout that um, may you know, present some problems. There may be shallower parts that heat up the water more and get more, um, you know, weed or bloom growth happening in the dugout. And there's also uh, shrubs near the edge of the dugout as well. So for, as far as planning goes, the desired locations you want are a proximity to the water use. I mean, if you if your water use is further away, the longer the line you run, you may have a problem with the electrical or the water line itself. As well, you want it to be close to a dependable electrical power supply. There are problems that happen with wiring and batteries. Um, although solar systems have been quite popular, you can have problems with them. Uh, tree stands can be a snow trap, but again, you wanna keep them far enough away so they're not a problem for the water quality. And to have it near other water sources is also a bonus in case you want to, you know, manage your water some way. If you need to put, take some water out of that other dugout and put it in, in the one you're using the water 
from, um, you can do that. And there are other management activities as well that I'll talk about regarding that. As far as the catchment area goes, grass waterways can help filter the sediments out, which carry nutrients. Uh, so you can keep them out of the dugout and on the land. And also the vegetative filter strips that surround the dugout can filter out these sediments as well. And good cropping practices are also important to keep those sediments and nutrients and other contaminants out of the dugout. You also want to have good access for maintenance, repair, and monitoring. That's important. You can also create long-term water management plans to see if you'll have a shortage or surplus during a time of drought. Um, so in these long-term water management plans, you can assess your current farm water supply, your current and future farm water demands. Um, and you, in, in those, you can plan for your expansion and peak use. I don't have a slide on it per se, but I do want to mention that the CAP water program has been open since July 5th, and there is potential funding available uh, for dugouts that meet our specifications. And there are other projects you can view on the cap.alberta.ca site. CAP stands for Canadian Agricultural Partnership. I didn't have it on the presentation because um, previously it, it, our program wasn't open, but be aware that we do, are facing a limited budget. And the sooner um, you put in your application, the better chances you have of getting funding. There is no promise of funding under this program. And, you know, times have been tight as far as the economy goes. And you can, if you have any questions about the program, you can phone me uh, about it later or, or call 310 Farm, that's 310 3276, and ask for a water specialist. So, just continuing on with uh, planning. As far as the water needs go, here are some examples of water usage that you would be calculating on a, a water management plan. So for calf pair, have a number of 12 gallons per pair per day for their usage. This is an annual average usage. If you're you know, watering during the summer, that might not be a bad number even in the summer. You might want to lower it for the winter. You're just wintering water because they drink less water during the winter for dairy cows 30 gallons per day for sw swine for lactating sows just for some examples six gallons per day and you should also you know think about every water use that you're going to be using for that from that dugout so spraying water for your crops fire protection as i mean actually this is the highest percentage of on that poll that i've received during all the webinars that i've done I think it was around 40% of the people said they were interested in fire protection and that can require quite a lot of water. And garden needs as well, don't forget them. Here's a schematic um, of how to calculate, or, or, or I'm going to be talking about how to assess a two-year drought supply and the schematic will sort of give you the idea of what happens over actually a period of, uh, well, two years and then for the start of the third year. So at the start of the first year, um, I'm, I'm not being a little facetious, but let's hope your dugout is full after the spring runoff. Maybe not this year, um, but here, let's say our dugout starts full after, at the start of the first year, then we have evaporation loss and then water use for the first year. And that cycle continues for the second year, the evaporation loss and the water use. And then um, there, the calculations that I'm gonna be going over include water tied up in ice at the end of the second year in case you're winter watering. It's not a big part of it, um, but if you wanna you know, downsize the number a little bit for ice loss, if you're summer watering, then you can do that. But so here at the start of the third year, we have the available water. There is some water on the, on the bottom that is dead storage, not usable, not palatable. And perhaps some of you have stories like that already, I don't know. So here's an evaporation zone map. And I've included a number of areas around you and to the south of you because uh, producers are allowed to attend 
uh, thing uh, as far as um, it usually goes from around, you know, a larger area. Since it's a Zoom webinar, you don't have to, have to travel for it. Most of the uh, places are going to be zoned to this blue zone. It's a contour map. Um, the least evaporative zone is zone one, then the second higher is zone two, then goes higher in zone two, then three. Uh, um, sorry, then zone two, then zone three, then, then zone four. And so I'm going to just have a, maybe a short example for zone three as well. So in zone two, where most of the producers will be from this webinar, includes Beaver County, MD, Bonneville, Lamont County, County Snowy Lake, Two Hills, Wainwright, and the north part of the MD of Provost. Um, this is about 4.7 times annual usage for that two-year drought supply. And this is for a 15 feet deep dugout. There are other factors for deeper dugouts that um, I have information for. And this accounts for all these losses that I, I went over. And I'm just gonna give an example of a 50 cow-calf pair at, 50, at 12 gallons per pair per day for uh, about a half a year, 180 days per year. This equates to 108,000 gallons per year. So that's the annual usage. If we multiply that by the 4.7 uh, factor for zone two, we get a 507,600 imperial gallon size dugout. I've often asked producers if they were sitting down before I told them this number because it's it's often larger than they thought they were going to build and a little more costly. Um, in, in, in just a quick example for the MD Provost in zone three, it's about 5.4 times annual usage. In the last, all the same factors, it gives you 583,200 imperial gallons. In some areas of the province down south, this is seven times annual usage so it can really spike up depending on where you are. Once you know the required volume, you can determine the rest of your dimensions. So you have an equation, you have the end number and you go back and plug in your other variables. So you'll need to de determine some design characteristics of the dugout to calculate all the rest of the dimensions. And there is a calculator on our open government website for it. If you look under decision making tools, uh, it'll be the under area land volume. It'll be called the dugout lagoon volume calculator. And we should be sending you out a link in a package after the webinars for this tool. It, you can play around with numbers, um, you know, adjust the length or the width. If you can, if you only have a certain size area to fit in, maybe you have a narrow strip or narrower strip that you need to fit it in or a wider strip. Um, so you'll want to try to reduce the surface area per volume to reduce the evaporation and wheat growth and, you know, hopefully lend to a better water quality. It's not a guarantee, but it'll help it somewhat. So a deeper dugout with steeper side slopes is preferred, but not too steep so as to prevent sloughing. So I, I often give an example of recommended um, minimum side slopes of 1.5 to 1. So no steeper than 1.5 to 1. And end slopes of 4 to 1. Uh, so, you know, in case of emergency, an animal can still get in for a drink of water if you're using it for recreation. Sometimes I give the recommendation of, you know, if you're fencing off the three sides, having one end open. Uh, so the, if the pumping system fails, they can get in for a drink of water. And you also protect that. But generally, the cattle will prefer drinking from a water trough, uh, you know, if they have the, the choice. And also, you should have at least a 10 foot bottom width, because when your dugout fills up with sediment, if you do not have a good bottom width, you'll lose depth quite quickly. And depth is important to have. So for this uh, um, MD of Bonneville area, uh, uh, yeah, for the MD of Bonneville example, this is a 507,600 imperial gallon dugout. So a little over half a million dugout for the side slopes that I mentioned, 1.5 to one and the end slopes of four to one um, it, and 15 feet deep. Uh, the top length and width, for example, you can make it longer or, or shorter. It would be 178 feet by 60 feet. And this will give a bottom, a good bottom width of 15 feet. 
<clears throat> now you need to see if you have a runoff watershed that will fill a dugout that size eight out of 10 years to make it feasible. If not, you'll need an alternate or additional sources of water, um, or you could reduce your usage from that dugout in a time of drought. Uh, some people are forced to sell cattle. You don't want the water to be the limiting factor um, you know, that makes you sell your cattle. You may not be able to control your pasture that much, but you hopefully will have more control of your water if you have enough water to fill a dugout big enough for a drought. Uh, and then you should uh, determine the area of your runoff watershed, and I'll be talking about that a bit later. As well, you should determine the characteristics of your land, and this will sort of factor into how much runoff you're going to get. So here's a map, and I've given ex an example for the Bonneville area. This is a runoff potential map. So for each contour, um, you have a different amount of acres that will take to fill a 1 million imperial gallon dugout. So this is uh, almost twice the size of, of the example size dugout of the 507,000 gallon dugout um, that I talked about. So for the Bonneville, it says that 100, a range of 100 to 250 acres per million imperial gallons is required to fill in, you know, that million gallon size dugout. So if you divide that by about a half for the example dugout that I gave, that would be a range of 50 to 125 acres. So, you know, as I mentioned, realizing this map, it's not gonna be the same exact in all of that yellow area for that zone. Uh, if you have rolling hills, you're gonna get more runoff than if you have flatter land. But these contours sort of take a bit into that, that into account. They don't take, take everything to, into account. They don't take cropping practices into account, for example. But it, at least it gives you a general idea of how big a, a, about a catchment area you need to fill a dugout that size. Here's some um, examples of, I was gonna say dugouts, but uh, holes in the ground. That's a good, good phrase, uh, holes in the ground. Um, so the top left picture here, we have zero to one slopes that have a 100% failure rate. In the bottom, we have bottom right, we have a nice picture with stable slopes. These are one and a half slope to one slopes. Just to give you an example, it's, it's a little bit deceiving sometimes looking at a picture uh, you know, it's it's better to look at, at it in the field, but it'll give you an a, a idea of what one and a half to one slopes look like. And these are stable in most acceptable soil conditions. Here in the top left, we see uh, concave sides. Uh, they're not just straight up and down, they're almost overhanging part of it. And you it's a very shallow dugout. You can see the cracks in the bottom. It's not, not funny, it's true. Um, and you can see boulders on the side. They're putting weight, pushing weight down on those slopes and they're gonna cause the, the sides to fail, which in fact they did very shortly after this hole in the ground was constructed. The bottom right, here's a, a dugout that was uh, constructed either by uh, a bulldozer, a crawler tractor or by a buggy they generally you know, have a longer, uh, shallower slopes, a longer uh, length. And so they're pushing, they're coming in one end and pushing out the other. And it, I think this might've been done, done by a buggy because this, the side slopes are you know, somewhat flatter and a cat could do a little, a little, uh, a little bit uh, straighter slopes or a little bit steeper slopes, but it's a nice looking dugout. You'll want to think about safety. Um, so you should have at least one flatter end slope, if not two, you know, to, so if something falls in, hopefully not a person, uh, uh, they can get out more easily. And you could install a flotation device, you know, if people are gonna be in the dugout and fencing as well. As uh, just continuing with, continuing with the design, as far as sedimentation and erosion control goes, uh, I mentioned vegetated, bu vegetative buffers and grass waterways. 
uh, ground cover is important. Um, and also you can install geotextile and or riprap to prevent slope degradation. Sometimes in the larger dugouts, you can get a fair amount of wave action as the wind fetches across the water and that can really erode this, the sides of the dugout. Also, where you have the water coming in, that can erode the side of the dugout as well. So you could, prevent, uh, you could protect that with geotextile and riprap to prevent that slope degradation. You should think about a two dugout system. This can be uh, quite valuable. So the first uh, dugout can be the sedimentation dugout where the water first enters into the dugout, the sediments fall out. You can do in situ treatment in that dugout and, and then transfer the clean water into the other dugout. Uh, or if you wanna clean one of the dugout, usually, I mean, if in a two dugout system, you're gonna have to clean the first dugout a lot more than you would have to clean the second dugout. Um, so if that, if you need to do that, you could pump water or the first dugout into the second dugout after treatment and then clean that dugout up, dugout out, and then you don't need to waste that water in the first dugout. As far as the spoil piles go, you can use them as a berm to prevent multiple entry points for runoff. Sometimes multiple entry points can cause rills in the slopes and destabilize them and uh, bring sediment into the dugout. Uh, it also can be help, uh, used to help protect from wind erosion in these larger dugouts, but they should be removed 15 feet from the edge to prevent, uh, you know, putting pressure on those slopes and causing them to slough. You should consider inlets. Uh, so if you have turbid water coming down, or if you have, say, in, in spring runoff, when the water is brown with manure in it, for example, because, because it's not filtered out much by the grass and uh, it's not sinking into the ground as much, then you can shut that flow off uh, and uh, you will need a bypass waterway for this. Um, but then when the water cleans up, you can open up the gate and let that water come in. You may require berms in conjunction with these and likely you will in conjunction with these inlets. And you can use, again, you can use a spoil pile to create those berms. I just have a picture of a very simple, just throw together uh, structure here, it's so weird. But I mean, you can build a better one yourself. This is just a farmer just used uh, some rebar with some plywood. And basically this slows the water down allowing the sediments to fall out of the water and be strained by um, the vegetation in the grass waterway. And I'm not, I, you know, uh, especially when we were having a lot of runoff and a lot of high flows come at times, five years ago in my area and up, up in areas around Bonneville there as well. Um, a lot of people I think could have made use of these weirs. I know I've, I saw it where in the area where I am here, but uh, and often I don't think people think about these weirs so much. So here's sort of an overall picture of a lot of the aspects I've been talking about. Here we have our waterway, our grass waterway coming down. We have a gated culvert allowing flow into the first of the two dugout system where you can do your treatment in. And then we have a culvert uh, where the water can be transferred into the second dugout. Here's an intake, I'll talk about that later, um, where you can pump the water out. And here we have the cattle watering out of the trough here. And this example is a little bit hard to fit in everything on the, the drawing, but normally you wouldn't want it, the water pipe coming from, uh, coming underneath the waterway, but it's just, it's just for, by way of example. And you have your buffer strips around the dugouts as well. <clears throat> so uh, when you're constructing the dugout, you should really get a soil test done. You want to have a fine grain material, clay, so you don't lose all your water. Uh, if you have coarse grain soils like sands or gravels, you could lose all your water out of the dugout. And I get a lot of calls about that. They didn't realize they were gonna hit um, them if they sometimes even if you do test holes you may not find a thinner 
sand vein. Um, so, you know, and, and also you should dig these test holes four feet deeper than you plan to, you know, excavate the dugout at, at. Because if you get to the bottom, you might have a sand vein underneath there, maybe six inches underneath where you're digging. And it probably wouldn't take long to pipe through that short distance. And then once a, a small hole's open, a small hole opens, the hole can get bigger, just like crack in the dam. And then it does take long for the rest of the water to go through there. So you can dig some holes with a bow. That's what often is done. But you can also drill holes as well. So. Um, I mentioned this sand and gravel veins. Some people do construct groundwater dugouts. This has the potential to contaminate the aquifer and you can lose all the water of the, out of the dugout. So you should consider a shallow well instead. We call these spring developments. We do have a fact sheet um, and we should be sending out, out a link after the webinars for this fact sheet. Uh, so, you know, there's different types of spring developments, but if it's groundwater dugout, it would be the low area spring development type that you'll be looking at. For groundwater dugout, the depth and size is, are not critical because it ebbs and flows in, because of the groundwater table that, that it's in or the aquifer that it's in. And it may not be dependable because if there's a drought that's not recharging that aquifer, then you could lose the water instead of gain water in the groundwater to go. Also, um, here let's say your dugout was filled up to the top. Over time, it can come, it can push down into the aquifer back to this original static water level. And here we're blaming the contamination on the horses in this schematic here. But here, you, then you're contaminating the aquifer as the if if you have you know poor quality water. If there's manure in there, it can get into the aquifer then. As far as excavating equipment goes, you can use track hoes. These are the most economical, the most popular, the most well used. Uh, you can get booms reaching over six, uh, 60 foot width of a dugout. Uh, and just, so you just make sure you select the right size of equipment depending on the size of the dugout you want to build. They're easy to transport. You can also use scrapers and buggies. Uh, scrapers are pulled by a crawler tractor. Buggies are self-propelled. These are fast and you can haul them distances. Uh, you can haul the spoil pile distances if need be. Uh, bulldozers or crawler tractors, um, they, they enter just like scrapers do. They enter and exit out ends. Uh, and you generally, you can do two to one side slopes with these at the steepest, but you can, I've seen steeper with the uh, crawler tractors. Some operators are better than others and they can go quicker than others. Others, But generally these do cost more per cubic yard um, of the size of the dugout to construct them, but they do a nice job. I, you know, I, I leave this last bullet on just for nostalgia. Um, <laughs> It says good in swampy areas, but of course you don't want to be digging in swampy areas. Leave it on as a bit of a... There's an old piece of equipment hanging around. They do have a good reach um, if you're you know, digging in the width of the dugout and they can move a lot of dirt. As far as hiring a contractor go, goes, you should get multiple quotes. You know, sometimes it's hard to uh, find a contractor, but you know, try to plan ahead you don't want to end up with something you regret. See if you can get a warranty in a written contract. It might be difficult, um, uh, and you might know the person anyway. So, but you know, it's good to know both as the agricultural producer who wants the dugout and the contractor that what will happen if you hit boulders or if you hit sand or if a liner is required. What? How will the costs? You know, what will happen to the costs? You, know, you can come to a decision on that then. So you should get an experienced uh, contractor that has a good reputation and sound construction practices. As far as liners go, sometimes you have to live with what you have. You may know that you have a sand vein or may find a sand vein, and then you may just have to live with it. You may have to line it with something so you can use a clay liner. 
Um, so if you use clay, um, one and you should have it a minimum of one and a half feet to three feet thick and pack it well with a sheep's foot packer. Or if you can run over and over again with the, a tractor that has knobby tires, this can be costly, especially if you have to haul the clay from elsewhere. Generally, it wouldn't be recommended if you have to haul it else from elsewhere. You can use plastic liners. The thicker, the better holes can be punctured in them. Sometimes the water pressure can come from underneath the liner and displace the liner. In this case, you might be able to construct a cutoff curtain. So if water is seeping into from the side of the dugout, you could construct a vertical trench and put a plywood with plastic in there and backfill it again to help cut that off. That doesn't happen often. Um, and then you can cover it, as you see in the picture, with a bit of sand. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, again, the thicker the liner, you should think about getting a thicker liner than a thinner liner. If you have, you know, if you've realized that your dugout is full and now you're losing dugout, not so much, there might be one spot that you know where you're losing it from. This, I just have this as a bullet. It, it's not very dependable, but you may be able to dump bags of bentonite clay in there and try to seal that spot off. Uh, bentonite is a clay that when ad water is added to it, it swells and provides an impermeable surface, but this is hit and missed with this. Uh, also, you can try adding some salt to uh, your soil material, material, if it's 20% clay, that's not a lot of clay. So adding salt will help improve the, the impermeability of the soil content. Uh, there has been a method that's used called glazation, where you mix six, a six inch thick straw layer with six inches of clay. So that's if you don't have a lot of clay to work with. You mix that well and compact it and then you have to wait a period of time during the hotter weather for a slime bacteria to grow and help improve the impermeability of that layer. That's a fair bit of work to do. And that's when you're in a bit more of a bind, you know, I would try to go with a plastic liner instead of that, but people have done that with some success. Now, moving on to intake systems, you want to take your water uh, from near the top, four to five feet from the top of the surface. So that'll be a floating intake. That's your best quality water. You'll avoid the floating algae and the poor quality water at the bottom of the dugout, with, which is low oxygen and maybe unpalatable. Uh, and so you can uh, run this floating intake into a wet well. I'll, I'm going to be showing a schematic of this in, in a sl uh, slide coming up here. And and this wet well, I'm sure you're familiar, a lot of are familiar with the term, can only, only need be a six to eight inch PVC casing. But just a back to the floating intakes, here's some examples of filters for the floating intakes that you, you could make or you could buy. Um, this one ha has a, like a fairly tight, it has, you know, uh, some mesh over the, the, the top of it, but inside then there's a cloth filter, sponge filter that can get plugged quite easily. So I don't really like this type of filter. Some people have, and this is why I include the picture. Here's another, sorry, uh, another intake and not really a filter. They just have holes drilled in, in a uh, uh, pipe here. Doesn't have a large intake area and can get easily plugged as well. At least you can make it yourself, but I'm gonna show you a picture of a one you can make yourself here. This is a five gallon bucket. You cut six to eight inch holes in the side, glue a mesh uh, around it. This is a plastic mesh, but you can put a wire mesh, mesh that is more uh, robust, stronger. And also then you put your fit, you drill a hole through the lid and put your fitting through the lid and you attach your polyethylene pipe uh, to that lid. And um, uh, also, so then you can pull this out uh, and, and take any weeds off as they come. But this has a large surface area intake. Uh, so it, it's a, it doesn't draw the weeds or the algae uh, to it as fast as it would with a smaller area intake. And I should just stop and uh, um, ask right now, 
normally I would take questions uh, as the time goes on. So Kelly, please feel free to in, interrupt me if there are questions um, that I need to answer. I don't think there are any at this time, but go ahead and interrupt me if need be. And I can always answer questions at the end as well. There'll be, there should be a good amount of time for that. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. So here's a schematic of what an, uh, a pumping system would look like. Here you have from the top view, you have your float. This float on the bottom picture is tied to your intake. That could be that five gallon bucket going into a polyethylene pipe that comes out the bottom, that comes to and through the bottom of the dugout um, at the side, going into a vertical stem pipe, which only need be a six inch or eight inch PVC well casing. In the old days, they used to use culverts. You don't need a big culvert for this. You can install a submersible pump with going through a pitless adapter, running into a pressure uh, system. You can also install a jet pump uh, with hoses coming out the top and then have your jet pump maybe in a house if you're winter watering and you'd have to insulate this top also if you're winter watering, but you can use that for summer watering. Jet pumps are you know, cheaper than submersible pumps. You should also install your aeration line in the, the same trench as the water line at the same time. I'll be talking about aeration later, I think in this part two. Uh, you'll have concrete weights weighing this line down as it can rise up. And uh, yeah, that uh, you can, and this is in the quality farm dugouts manual you can view later. And here you're gonna be attaching your, your floating intake, your intake to uh, with a rope to a post on the side so you can pull it out um, so you can maintain that intake. What we don't recommend is a bottom intake. There are some people that you know have had rigid pipes near the bottom of the dugout where the poor quality of water is. Also, people have had gravel infiltration trenches. This is a good place for bacteria to grow, slime bacteria, as well as leaching out hardness out of the gravel. Uh, and it could get plugged up as well. And so you'll want to avoid those types of systems. As far as pumps go, I mentioned jet pumps. You don't need a well, wet well for jet pumps. You can just actually throw an intake over on the surface of the dugout and have your, your hose coming on top of the land at, on top of the side of the dugout coming into your jet pump. But beware that you aren't able to uh, you know, draw the water up more than 20 feet of vertical suction. That's approximately the maximum list, lift. Uh, I talked to the one fellow who had a, his his water line ran fair ways to where he was using it, and it was way up the hill, and his jet pump was way up the hill. So I just told him to move his jet pump closer to the dugout, and that solved the problem. Uh, you can also use submersible pumps. Uh, you will need a wet well for this, as shown in the schematic. And common sizes are, are one half horsepower, three quarters horsepower, and one horsepower. I just want to go back to the schematic again for a bit. This line here going into the standpipe, it doesn't need to be a large diameter line. Um, I mean, a two inch would do a fair amount of cattle because you're drawing on demand out of the dugout here. So direct watering causes a lot of problems. It causes a shorter lifespan of the dugout here. You can see the cattle in the dugout, they're punching in the sides. They're, um, you know, get, they can get foot rot if a, a cryptosporidium outbreak occurs, uh, it can catch like wildfire um, in the herd. And that has happened when they're direct watering. You can see the water is very brown here. There's so many sediments in the water and also the manure gets in there. The, these provide nutrients for the growth of, you know, potentially toxic algae, which I'll talk about in the part two of this dugout webinar series. And there are also livestock safety risks where the cattle fall through the ice or get stuck in the mud and then they have to deal with the bodies. And I'll be talking about that in part two as well. As well as uh, th there is also environmental habitat loss. A, a healthy dugout is a dugout where aquatic organisms can live, uh, flora and fauna. 
uh, uh, just continuing with remote livestock watering. Uh, the purpose of livestock watering is to exclude the water, the cattle from the dugout. So you have stock tanks as a point of watering. These stock tanks should be in a location where when the rain falls, it's going to wash the manure downstream of the dugout so it doesn't go back into the dugout. Um, solar systems can, can be used with batteries. You can also have wind powered systems uh, with batteries, but you would also need large tanks as part of the storage because when the wind doesn't blow for a number of days, you, you still need water for your cattle or whatever you're using it for if, it's, if you need water in, in a timely fashion. You can also use dual solar and wind. That's more costly, but it's, it's uh, sort of a good fit together. Nose pumps can also be used. These are pumps for the uh, cattle use their nose <clears throat> to, to move a lever, to pump water into a bowl that they can drink. And you might have a little runoff for calves um, if there are calves. So some of the water that the cow pumps will run into a smaller bowl where only calves can access it. You can use gravity systems. I've had questions about gravity systems. That, that would be nice if you could use a gravity system but because then you don't need power. There can be problems with winter watering at times with gravity systems because if the water has to come out somewhere where that is, it can freeze up. Livestock access ramps are not preferred, but if you have a large number of cattle and you can't, I don't know, I can't seem to come up with a really good reason why you can't get enough watering bowls, but some people do it. They have very large numbers of animals. Um, at least protect it, the one end that you fence off all the three ends and have the access in one end where you have uh, geotextiles and rip wrap to protect where the cattle are entering into the dugout. Uh, so yeah, storage uh, as in like a, a tank, and, and this could be like a, a tank that uh, gravity feeds into a watering bowl. Uh, you, this is used with watering systems to have water available in case of system failure, but also, you know, to, it, um, I mean, system failure could mean if you have a, even a solar system, your wiring could fail, your batteries could fail. Uh, so that water will still be available for the cattle and you won't have to be going and checking it every, every so often. Here's just a simple example of a solar system uh, and the shack for the, for the um, pressure tank if, you, if, if they have one. And just be aware that you should hide, hide your solar systems, not from the sun, but from thieves, because I've had a number of people tell me how they've had their solar panels stolen from them. Uh, as far as protection of water quality goes, I mentioned the berms to divert poor quality water. So there may be some runs, there may be multiple runs where your dugout can come in. And, and one of these runs may be always poor quality water. So you could just divert that downstream of your dugout. And also, I mentioned the point of watering it where you're watering cattle up bowl. You can use berms also to divert that water downstream of your dugout. And fencing again, I've mentioned as well. Uh, this is the end of the webinar. Um, that's generally the, the time. So we leave about a half hour for questions that, that I plan for. But I do want to mention the reference materials. A lot of the information in these two parts of the series uh, are, are in the Quality Farm Douglas Manual, but some information is not. Uh, but you can use that as a reference. We have the Open Government website, the L Dugout Lagoon Volume Calculator I mentioned. But there are also a number of good fact sheets of treatment for dugouts, which I'll be talking about in the uh, um, part two, as well as a number of other issues for water quality and, uh, you know, pasture water systems, etc. We, Agri Alberta Agriculture has one of the best websites in the world for uh, agricultural information. We used to, I was going to edit this, we used to have an aquacultural link on the Alberta Agriculture website. Now, Alberta Environment and Parks um, is the regulatory body for that. And I'll be talking about that in part two, but we do have some information on our agriculture website about aquaculture you can view. 
I'm just going through all of them here. And, and these other fact sheets I'll mention in part two. And that concludes the part one of the dugout webinar series. Any questions? Uh, if people would like to type them in the either the chat or the question box if they have questions, it'd be great. But uh, in the interim, I will thank you so much for your presentation. Um, there were a few questions whether or not uh, people will be able to view the recording and I will send out a link for people to be able to rewatch it. Okay. I imagine more people than ever are thinking about fire, uh, uh, you know, in case of fire. So in basically any case you want to you want to have a good quality water in your dugout for any use. So you want to be monitoring your dugout regularly and taking all these best management steps to, you know, start with the, the best quality water that you can. It looks like there's no questions, but uh, the next part should be interesting. Interesting. There's a number of interesting growths and how to treat them. So. Hope you join I us guess, for the I, I do have a question. Um, if you were um, putting in a new dugout and you wanted to vegetate it around, what would your suggested um, species be? Um, like you're looking either for something deep rooted that will hold the, the banks in, or what would you recommend? Good question. And I usually had a uh, document about, about that, and I think I will include um, some information about it. But generally, like, you know, try to select native grasses that are not flat bladed that don't bend that don't grow so tall and then they bend over and actually your filtration can get even worse than if they bend over um, then it provides almost like a slippery slide for the water to you know enter into the dugout uh, and I, I think brome was one example so I'm going to provide those the examples of the native grasses also you'll want to maintain it so that it doesn't get too fall and then a uh, too tall and then bend over and provide that slippery uh, um, you know situation. So you you should be mowing it um, every so often. Something that has good rooting. And I will yeah I will include that. I'll send that information to you, Kelly, for for some of those grasses, the sp specific species. Perfect. Good question. Um, if there is no other questions, if people think of questions before next week's webinar, please email them to uh, myself and that way we can um, get them answered uh, at the next session. Uh, there was one question that came in just now. They have an existing dugout and their renter has decided to put in a portable solar system in place with the water line coming up on one edge of the tank. Uh, is that the correct way? The water line coming up on one edge to the tank. I'm not 100% sure what that means. Do you know what they're getting at, Kelly? If they could just type in the chat just to explain edge of the dugout. Is it over the top of the land? Um, or is it trenched in through? Okay, over top. If they're only summer watering, they can they can do that. I mean, it's not as permanent a system. It, it can certainly function. You wouldn't want that for winter watering because it, it'll freeze up. But yes, a lot of people do that. And they may be moving a system to, to another place. And so they may want to pull up that system and take it somewhere else. So that, that is a, a valid system. And uh, obviously you'd be using something like a jet pump, not a submersible pump. There's also some algae on the top. Should it be treated? It depends. You may not need to treat the algae. You have to, first of all, identify that. Please uh, attend part two because I will be talking exactly ab about that question there. I'll be going over the different species of algae because there is a number of species and some species are susceptible to some treatments and some are not. Um, so I hope you do attend part two there. And there's another question. Can I just read it, Kelly? Yeah, of course. Okay, what size of dugout qualifies for the government program? So uh, they're referring to the water program, which is the only program available. 
Um, again, that's cap.alberta.ca. We have a funding list that is, uh, it goes over all the details in case you don't write them down here, but 440,000 gallons is the minimum volume. 13 feet deep is the minimum depth. 1.5 to 1 slopes, that's 1.5 horizontal to 1 foot vertical as an uh, example of some of the slopes for the sides I gave in, in the webinar. That's the steepest we allow, and that just provides some weed control uh, and, and reduces the surface volume to, uh, sorry, surface area to volume rate ratio, hopefully for, for promoting better quality water. Uh, those are some of the specifications. If you're enlarging the dugout, you have to enlarge it by at least 200,000 gallons or 25% of the original volume, whichever is greater. And you can read through all those details on the funding list on our website. Thank you for that question. And again, you can contact me if you, you do need to contact, if you're looking for funding, you do need to contact a water specialist before you start construction or purchase anything. That is, seems to be the end of the questions. Well, thank you everybody, uh, everybody for coming tonight and uh, joining us. And thank you, Sean, again, for your presentation. Um, oh, there was one final question. Um, can it be applied to existing dugouts? So you did talk about dugout expansion. Yeah, dugout expansion, dugout enlargement. You do have to enlarge it by 200,000 gallons or 25% of the original volume, whichever is greater as well as the other parameters like slopes and depth uh, that I mentioned. Yeah, and, and just, sorry, one more short thing. Program rules have changed, so be sure you read up the rules um, uh, before you construct a project. Thank you for the comment. And thanks again, Kelly, for organizing and hosting this. Well, thank you for presenting. Um, yeah, so uh, watch for an email with the, the resource list. Um, I will also send a cap link um, and uh, a link to rewatch this webinar for everybody. And if they have questions, if you have questions that come up during the next week before the next webinar, please do email them to me and we'll answer them for sure at the next webinar. So thank you everybody for coming and enjoy your evening.